Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Charles Owen from Paladin. So glad you're attending. Thank you so much for tuning in, whether you're watching it live or you're tuning in after the fact. Uh, either way works. And as a matter of fact, as we all know, customers come first. So if you get interrupted during this presentation anytime, feel free to put on pause and, and come back to it later. And uh, you can watch the whole thing in its entirety because we are recording it. So with that, uh, if you have any questions in this webinar, you feel free to put them into the questions dialog box on the GoToWebinar screen here, and we can address those. So today's topic is about invoice store setup tab, and we're gonna go through each one of these, and you can hopefully discover things in here that you aren't using today that might be more um, geared towards what you need to do and, and set things up so i just want to make sure i want to check in here with my uh with my attendee here and make sure that we're you can see and hear me it looks like i got a raised hand here from brian thank you brian appreciate it all right so let's go ahead and get started then so the what you're going to learn today is the review of the various switches lob, levers knobs and dials and settings and different things that what that modify some of the invoicing process and this will enable you to take particularly you know affect changes in the invoicing uh in the invoicing uh, module so you're going to be able to look at these different things and set them to help your store to um, better uh, you know incorporate procedures and or best practices also, uh, how to turn on and off uh, cashier messages and prompts for reducing potential cashier mishaps during checkout process. We're going to learn about that. And then also along the way, we're going to learn about uh, some of the new features in, in system as well. So let's just jump right into it. Now, what I've done is showed you first how to get into the invoice store tab. In Paladin, you'll go to file on the top left hand side of the screen, select setup. And then from there, you're going to get a drop down or a, a new dialog box here, and you're gonna select invoice store. That is how you access the invoice store. Now, if you don't have permissions to this or to the menu or file setup area, obviously you won't be able to do this, so you'll need to get a manager or the owner of your store who's ever got the proper credentials to go into this. Once you're into it, you'll find that uh, there are a gobs of different things that you can set, you know, upwards of, well, I don't know, I'm guessing about maybe 50 or more. And I've broken those down into four different sections so we can work with each of the sections in this, in this long list of settings. All right, so under section one, we're gonna go ahead and dissect that first, starting with the first one. And uh, the first one is require signature for returns. So you might think this just prompts you for the signature when the, you know, prompts the customer for the signature when you do a return. Well, that is true, it does that. But it also does something else. It prompts for an ID, a name, a phone number, et cetera. So you can track who is doing the returns. This is uh, optional, but I think you actually have to have a name in there. I could be wrong, it says there's a little red asterisk next to it, so the odds are you're gonna to have to at least fill in a name, which is kind of nice when you're doing a return so you can know who's returning what. Now, rather than typing in a name, when that dialog box pops up, you'll notice under the ID field, there is a little, looks like a, a little ID or something turned sideways. That means that you can scan it with the 2D scanner. So if you just, on the back of the driver's license, there's a little, little barcode on there. There's actually, in some cases, in my case, in the state of Oregon, there's two. One's just a standard line barcode, and the other one's a squiggly line barcode. It's the squiggly one that you wanna use. And you wanna kind of put your thumb over the, the easy barcode because uh, sometimes it can, it can scan that one and not the other one. So depending on how close they are to each other. So that's what that first item does under invoice and store tab. The next one we come down to is set initial focus on the customer field. So in, in a lot of cases, if you are doing a lot of customer accounts, you wanna just go right straight into the customer drop down list as soon as you pull up invoice and quotes. So what this will do is it'll change the cursor rather than showing up under the part number, which it normally shows at, 
it'll, it'll the little cursor will sit there right the customer so now you can type in a customer or part of a customer name or an account number or what have you or go into advanced lookup and look up more information on the customer but that's what it does it repositions that cursor when you first go into the invoice screen if that would be helpful to you you have access to go in and change that same with the signature as well the next section in section one is enable kit functionality. So we have a kit functionality that is uh, is very nice if you have a lot of different items that you're selling and it's a kit such as a dog house or a, um, some sort of a outhouse or, or, or a garage or something like that or an outbuilding of some sort. Or it can even be something as simple as a, as a, a toolbox that you put together for first time home buyers. You know, it can be one SKU, and then that one SKU adds a ton of things underneath it up to, you know, as many different line items as you wish. So the kits are are highlighted and, and shown to you when you go into the uh, recall a transaction. You can see the kits there, and that shows you what kits are available. So first thing you want to do is check the enable kit functionality if it isn't already checked. In most cases, it's already going to be checked. And then once you check it, you need to make sure that there is a class number that you you specify for kit items. So you may need to go into the class the class setup under this uh, file setup and click on class and add a unique class ID to be used as the uh, kit trigger. So it does require that you have a class ID number associated with the kit functionality. Now, when you create a kit trigger and you will have to go into that inventory item and under classes you'll associate the kit in this case 68 with that class field under the inventory item itself once you do that now you're all set up to go into your invoicing create your kit save it and then from that point forward all you have to do is type one SKU to populate all the ingredients of that kit now beyond that, there's some additional features in the in the kit capability. You have the ability to enable uh, the hiding of kit components. So this is we've had this request from several several different uh, farm stores, uh, feed and seed stores, where they say, you know what, we create our own super kitchen or uh, turkey feed or or uh, chicken feed and we want to make sure that our customers don't know what's in it but at the same time we want to make sure that we properly extract inventory or decrement the inventory out of stock on hand for those components where well, you can do that in addition to that you can disable components from being changed on the screen by the by the cashier so the kits uh, I'm sorry yes the kits if you want to hide all of the items in the kit other than the first or kit trigger, you would set those prices at zero. And there's a whole knowledge base article on this. So you can get at portal.paladinpos.com or if you click on the help button, go into knowledge base and Paladin, you can learn more about this. All right, so the next section here is enable inventory on hold. Again, most of you probably have this set up, but if you don't, you're going to want to consider activating this because this allows you to put items on hold so they actually extract them from the stock on hand and inventory and put them into the on hold bucket and then the little magnifying glass next to the on hold bucket will enable you to see who those particular items are, are on hold for this is what it looks like in the inventory in this case You've got 34 that are available for selling and then 12 that have been earmarked for somebody else. So again, that little magnifying glass next to the 12, you can click on that and see exactly who these 12 are on hold for. And in this case, they're on hold for three different people. I don't show that here, but trust me, they are. The suggested order report will then use the updated stock on hand to properly order your products again, based on, based on the um, analytics built into the system, it'll go ahead and say, hey, we're not gonna pay attention or use that 12 on hold in our calculation for determining the forecast amount because those items for all intents and purposes have already been sold. They're at least earmarked for somebody. Let's move on to the next section, which is default to largest pricing quantity when added to invoices. 
I would imagine that a fair number of you do this. And if not, this is a great way to protect items like the uh, one foot of wire um, to be sold as one foot, but one spool you don't want to sell as one foot. So this could potentially uh, potentially uh, deal with that issue. Let's look at a, an example of the wire, right? So you've got part 30238. It is sold both in uh, by the foot at 50 cents a foot or $100 for 250 feet. Again, if you just scan this spool, it might come up as the per foot price. And if it came up to one, that cashier, if not paying attention, could potentially sell this entire spool for a one foot price. Not a good day. I'm sure it's happened to several of you. Doesn't take more than one time for a cashier to do it before they will now pay attention the next time. But we've got this little stop gap in there where we default it to the highest quantity. So rather than the customer not informing you that you're selling a whole spool for a foot price, they will inform you if you're, they're trying to buy a foot and they're getting charged for 250 feet, right? Just makes sense. So in addition to that, we have another feature just below it that enables you to turn on a pop-up box. It says, hey, attenzione, this item has multiple pricing levels. Make sure that you verify the quantity being sold. Right, so you can only get out of this by pressing the OK with the mouse or hitting the F8 key. But again, another measure to help prevent the cashiers from selling products at uh, lower cost than they should be sold. And this, in conjunction with the one before, is, is really a good way to prevent really your cashiers from from ever selling anything, uh, you know, a whole spool for a price of one foot. All right, let's move on to section two. Section two, we start out with open cash drawer for selected payment types. This is a pretty specific um, you know, little note here. I mean, it's very easy to see that this setting allows you to determine when the cash drawer opens based on the payment type. And you can see in that little drop down, we have check boxes there. And you can go through all different types of transactions and say, hey, when this type of transaction happens, open the check of the cash drawer, but when they're not checked, they won't open. For example, check probably shouldn't be check marked here because checks, you can usually just slip them in the slot in the top without having to open the cash drawer. So on beyond that, below that, there's don't open cash drawer for $0 cash sales. So if you do have cash activated, which you would for the cash drawer to open, if it's a $0 amount, then it will not pop the drawer. So just another setting that you can do to help protect that cash drawer, making sure it doesn't open unnecessarily. Moving on to the second section of section two, we've got disable automatic receipt at checkout. Well, this is pretty much what it is. If you check this, you will not automatically get receipts at checkout. They will, they will turn that feature off. Well, if you turn that feature off, you still have an option at the end of the transaction, as you know, with a box that comes up says, what do you want to do now? Do you want to print a duplicate receipt? Would you like to print a full sheet receipt or a, a full eight and a half by 11? Would you like to print a uh, yard order, a delivery copy, uh, email it? Uh, you know, there's different things that you can do, or you can produce a, a gift receipt as well. Well, if you turn it off, you're just not going to get any, any receipts whatsoever. So you can check you know, click number two, for example, to get a duplicate receipt. And that very first receipt that you print out will not have the word duplicate on it because it's the first time that receipt has been printed. Now, if you're doing it today, you will see the duplicate on there. I can almost guarantee it. This is in uh, beta right now. It will be rolling out to all stores to where that duplicate will be taken off of that first time print. So, you know, this will hopefully help you in making sure that you know when when you print a receipt the first time it doesn't have duplicate on there but any other time after that point it will have the word duplicate on it so you can see here where normally it says duplicate well if you set this setting to disable automatic receipts it can remove that for you all right moving on to the next one add alternate part numbers from invoicing this one was added uh, more so when you're kind of designing and setting up your inventory. 
it's uh, it's kind of a one of those settings where you want to be aware of because if you set this to on add all to important numbers from invoicing, what it will do is when it when you scan an item and it doesn't find it in the inventory, it's waiting for that next scan to associate it to the barcode. Meaning, if you scan a product ID code or a part number that isn't recognized in Paladin, then the second time when you scan the uh, a, a second item, let's say you turn the product over and you see the UPC code and you scan that, then that uh, part number will be associated with that alternate part number from that moment forward. So it's a great feature when you're building your inventory. Not so great if you have a not so uh, aware cashier up at the front counter, they scan something that says part number not found, scan the alternate part number, and then they move to the second item, right? Then in that case, you need to be uh, you need to be aware and definitely you don't want to turn this on. So this setting will associate the alternate part number with the first item scanned. So the cashiers just need to know that if you have this feature on now and it's working for you, great. Again, you just have to you just have to educate the cashiers. The RF gun actually works this way. If you take the radio frequency terminal, the gun out in the aisles and you scan something that is not recognized, it comes up and says this alternate part number. And then you'll scan maybe the UPC code, and then from that moment forward, it'll all be connected. So it's a great feature for the RF gun, not so great when you're working uh, checkout. All right, let's continue on here. So the next one is use alternate core charge identifier. So the core charge are things like returning battery fee, the paint fees, uh, you know, recycle fees, there's different things. Well, you now have the capability to change that. It comes default with the word core charge or the two words core charge. In this case, I changed that identifier to paint fee. You could go so far as to just changing it to fee or recycle fee or just you know making it as generic as possible because we have another feature in the system that where you can associate classes with different different core charges and then produce the reports. So for example, if you said a the paint items to a class of, uh, of, of a core charge, it will automatically break out for you in a report all of the paint fees, even though it says the word fee, it'll break out all the paint fees for you based on that class and everything else accordingly. So it's a, it's a great feature. If you still, it says core charge and you're okay with that, leave it, but uh, you have an opportunity to change it. And now with so many different things like recycle fees, paint fees, uh, battery exchange, you know, all of these things. It's uh, it's important to to more branch out on that a little bit, a little bit uh, further, and, and get get more specific about what the core charges uh, are. All right, moving on to the next one. Section two: Disable auto combining of rows. If you're in a store and you do instant savings, this feature uh, cannot be altered. But for, for most other stores, you can you can disable this. The reason we cannot disable it for ACE Instant Savings is because it requires that second row or the, the, the uh, combining. So by selecting this option, the items, if it's scanned more than once, it will augment that quantity field in the invoicing system. So see my example down below, show a foam paintbrush, quantity 10, I've scanned it twice. In this case, it's set to the highest quantity discount break. Back on the prior setting to uh, you know, have a default to the highest discount. We do that here. And so it just when you scan it a second time, it puts 20. Most of the time, it'll be two, two, three, four, every time you scan it. And it doesn't have to be scanned in succession. It can be scanned anytime throughout the invoice. And it will recognize that, hey, that item's already been scanned. Let's go ahead and augment that quantity. The message combined with line one will not show up anywhere. It just pops up there for the cashier to see that something was done. Let's move on to the next one. Display only quotes that match account number. So this is by selecting this option when you recall stored quotes, by default, it will show only quotes tied to the existing customer that you have called up in the, um, in the invoicing screen. 
So if the box is unselected, it will show both known customer and cash or unspecified customer quotes. Basically, by unselecting this box, it'll automatically show, you know, show for all customers. So when you go into to the um, to the quotes and you you look at the, the the quotes that are stored in your system, it'll go ahead and if you have a customer selected and brought up on the screen, it will only show the quotes for that particular customer. Unless you go ahead and you can follow the blue arrow here and check the box show for all customers, then you can see everything. Well, by selecting this box, display only quotes that match account number, it will automatically activate the show for all customers so you don't have to think about it. All right, moving on. Filter yard order printing by inventory location. So this is really cool. If you don't use this today, when you print yard orders, you're getting a yard order for everything that you've sold at checkout, including the in-store products and the store, the products out in the yard. So what you can do here is you can turn off any in-store products and say, limit it only to my yard uh, location, inventory locations. Meaning I don't need to see in the yard my pick list of items I need to pick from the yard if they've already picked them up in the store. I only wanna see the, the items I need to pick. That's what this does. And when you create your location, inventory location codes, Make sure that your ID numbers for those locations are in some sort of a sequential uh, area. In this case, uh, location ID 69 through 90 happen to be all of the, the items that are outside of the store. Next, you can auto print yard order. So as you know now, it asks you if you want to print a yard order at the, at the conclusion of the invoice. And you have the option to go ahead and say, yep, Option, I think it's number four, print yard order. And it will print the yard order. And you can print it either to the printer inside the store, or you can have a printer sitting in the yard where it prints out on either way. Well, if you miss that print yard order and you try to go back and reprint the yard order, it's not there. So you would have to print something that resembles a yard order, which we have available in the case of you need something like that. But if you select the auto print yard order, Cashier doesn't even have to think about it. If there are location ID codes that are that you that match the location ID code in this setup, and you have items in your invoice, it'll automatically print your yard order. So what if you just have in-store products? Well, it won't print your yard order. Only if those there are items that are in the yard will it print. So that's a that's a great feature. Let's move on to section three. So we're about halfway done here. I'll try to scoot through this a little quicker. So use receipt printer for invoice reprint. So when you go to recall your invoices, you can, when you print those invoices, rather than it printing to a PDF document where it takes the three inches and kind of shoves them over to the left of this full page, you can actually have it print right, right on the receipt printer as a duplicate receipt. And you, you set this printing, uh, you activate the use receipt printer. It'll every time you go in, you click for an extra re invoice, and you can do those invoice reprints from uh, invoicing from the customer module. And when you do that, it'll automatically produce a a, a printout on the actual printer itself. All right, hide. Uh, let's move on to the next one, which is so. Here's what it looks like. Yeah, so we've got. Uh, I just show a little receipt here and it prints on an actual receipt versus on a eight and a half by 11. All right, hide item, regular retail on invoice. So in this case, if you, it does exactly what it says. It will hide the regular price and only show you the sale price or discounted price. So for example, if the regular price is $1.19 and you have a sale price of $1.07, the receipt's only gonna show $1.07. Now, why would you want this? Well, in some cases, in lumber yards, sometimes, they actually charge more for certain items for certain people. And they wouldn't want necessarily the regular price to show up, they just want whatever price you put in. So that's there as well. And then in some cases, you know, the discounts might not be as steep as, as the consumer wants. And if they see, oh, I'm getting a three cent discount, whoop you do you know, sometimes that is uh, kind of an insult to them. So you can turn off the regular prices and just show the sell price and it takes the whole mystery out of it. Let's move on to the next one, which is hide. Oh, there it is. So I just show the, the regular price of $1.07 in this case. 
So the next section or the next item on the list is invoice F4 discount respects minimum margin. So there is an F4 discount key at the bottom of your uh, screen in invoicing. And when you select that, it allows you to do whatever discount percentage you want. And that can be across one item or multiple items in your invoice. Unless, however, you check this box. And then it, there will be a cap of a discount. The cap will be whatever you set as your minimum margin. Minimum margins can either be set across the board. You say, I don't want anything going out of my store less than 30% margin. Great. Unless I've got it, you know, the pricing set as such, but it won't discount any further than that. So if you had an item that's already under 30 and you go ahead and select discount with the F4 discount, it's going to say, uh uh, it's just going to leave you at whatever price it was. But if there was 40% margin and you put a discount in, it'll discount it down to the 30% cap that you put in the system. Minimum margins can also be set at the, the department level as well. So to continue with this, so it shows you that in fact, if you do have this uh, checked or unchecked, you can go ahead and check or uncheck it during the invoicing process, providing you have the correct permissions. So this is what the discount window looks like when you go into that F4. And now you can put in a percentage discount and you can see that because it comes up by default with the checkbox, it means it's already been checked in the setup. But again, as a manager, you can un un select that if you wish. Uh, to continue on to the next one, it says F4 discount applies to manually priced items. So what are these? These are your fasteners. These are items, dump skews, if you will, items that you don't price until they're actually there to pick them up. And we do handle the margin with the reference margin, as you probably know. Uh, we can handle this so it, it it doesn't matter what price you put in at checkout, it'll respect what the minimum what the reference margin is, and it will appropriately uh, put in your margin and and uh, and profit. But this uh, this just again the same thing. If you don't check this, it automatically uh, allows you to check it, or if it's checked, it you can uncheck it as long as you have the manager approval code. All right, so now we move on to the next item, which is capture return item invoice number. So these are on returns. So this is a, a best practice to help enforce cashiers to make sure that they only give the money back that was uh, that was paid for a particular item upon a return. And at the bottom of the invoice of every invoice is a barcode. That barcode resembles the invoice number. So if they get that prompt at checkout, all they have to do is scan the bottom of the receipt and it's going to recall the original price that was paid for the item and compare it exactly to the penny. Great best practice to have. If you don't have this activated, I recommend it. You will need to train your cashiers because if they don't fill anything in or they don't have a receipt to scan or an invoice number to put in, it's going to come up and uh, normally it would say here's the invoice, but if it's not put in, it's going to say skip by the cashier. And again, you can produce a report on the employee exception report that shows you all of these skipped items. And you can go ahead and, and correct the cashier or train the cashier on how to do that. Again, it helps really enforce the best practices for returns. Moving on to the next one, a pretty simple one as well. Display description, description two on the invoice and quote. So by default, this, the description two does not show on the invoice screen. It will, however, show on the printed invoice copy. So if you want the invoices to on the screen to show description two, which I would think everybody would, it's just it's just common sense. If you have stuff on description two, you want to make sure that the cashier can see it. And then if you want to block that information from the receipt, we now have a method where you can go ahead and block description two from invoices. So if you've got things that say under description two, you know. Um, discontinued by supplier or something like that or a, a message that isn't really meant for consumer you can turn off description two on the invoices and reprints so description two kind of gets shoved in there on the actual invoice screen itself between the description one and the price and just says in this case i put a little note in there about this but that is what i'm talking about when i refer to description two and this is found in the inventory next to description one strangely enough description two all right let's uh 
next one here, disable customer store transaction count pop-up. So there is a box that pops up normally if this is activated for you that informs the cashier that, hey, we got a stored quote for this person. You know, we got a quote or we got an order or we have a special order or we have an on hold that makes a, just kind of points to the, to the cheat code or the button to press on the bottom F6 to recall that particular order or quote or special order or on hold. It's a very handy little pop-up box. It doesn't interfere with anything, just pops up on the screen. You can continue scanning at that point, it just, it'll go away. But if you want to go in and say, oh, this could be the quote that I need to pull up that we've already done, and rather than doing it a second time, let me just call up the prior or previous quote. So it, that by checking this box, it just suppresses this pop-up box. Again, I think it's very helpful. Next, do not accept checks from non-charge account customers. So this just kind of does a blanket across the board, turns off accepting of checks for anybody that does not have a credit limit of greater than zero. So if they have a credit limit of one cents or a dollar or $10 or $10,000 or $100,000, great. They will be able to write checks. But all the others that the customers that are in your system, they'll just be denied the writing the check writing capability. However, you can go in and make an exception. You can go into that particular non-charge account customer and activate accept checks from customer, and then that will enable you for that particular customer to be able to take checks. Just a handy little across the board, kind of you know how you deal with, with checks. The last one in section three is deleted part behavior. So what do you want to happen after you delete the part? Do we delete parts forever? No. Do we delete customers forever? No. You know, in order not to change history, we make sure that that's all in the system. It's flagged as deleted, but it's just not, uh, it's not being displayed on the active, you know, part list. But you can restore it. And all you have to do is re to restore it is to scan the item or put in the UPC code or part number, and it will go ahead and restore it. Well, this enables you to figure out how you want to restore it. Do you want it to auto restore? Meaning if you're at checkout and you scan the item, do you just want the cashiers to continue moving on like nothing ever happened and just automatically reactivate that product? Probably, that's a good setting to have at checkout. Prompt for restore is another one where it can prompt for a restore. And then, and then uh, when it prompts for restore, it can say you're about to restore this part, make it active, click restore to confirm, to say restore and now it's active again. Of course, when you delete an item, it does, if there's any stock on hand, it puts it as shrinkage. When you renew it, it retains it as shrinkage and brings in that part number at a zero number. So if you're selling it, check out, you'll have a negative one, which is totally fine. All right, the last one is part number not found. If you set it to this one, cashiers uh, will not be able to reenact or reinstate items, product without the proper manager approval. Our last section, section four here, is uh, enable EMV receipts and then also disable EMV receipts for invoice reprint. Back in the days, this was a required setting when, you know, in October 15th of 2015, when EMV first came on the scene, they, several of the processors made it required that an EMV receipt be given to the customers. So that's why you see that EMV receipts must be enabled for EMV equipped stores because it was a requirement. It no longer is a requirement, so you can disable it. Um, but do check with, uh, with, with MasterCard Visa, make sure that in your local area, you know, you're able to do this. And then the, the second one is, if you're doing invoice reprints on a receipt printer, you can also have the EMV receipt print out for that or you can disable it and turn it off. By default, I think it's on, so you'll wanna probably disable that. All right, moving on. Almost through this, enable the ability to skip signatures when a customer is not present. So this is primarily and only for pharmacies. So when they have a back office or back end pharmacy where they're not doing any new customers at checkout, they aren't, they aren't there to sign, we can turn off signatures and just skip them all together. Recall transaction default sort order. So in this case, when you are recalling transactions in the invoice and quote, and uh, you, well, yeah, under the, under the uh, recall quotes, basically, 
you can determine what the sort order is. Most of the time it's by date, it defaults by date in descending order, but it can be alphabetic as well. You can see I've changed the name to be the primary one on the actual printout or the sample I show here. Of course, on the setting it says date descending, but in fact I've chosen alphabetical for this one list. But if I had checked a date, it would be in the proper date on the, on the right hand side. So it's just the F6 recall transaction button. Okay, so the uh, you can disregard this one. It's an internal setting. It's not highlighted for our customers. It's grayed out. It's just an internal thing for text only. Uh, the next one is enable quote numbers. So there's been a request that, hey, we need a quote number. I want to go ahead and quote my number my quotes. So it makes it really easy when the contractor calls in and I say, I got quote number 435. I'm ready to move. Let's do it. Uh, all you have to do is search for quote number 135. So what it looks like is when you activate this, automatically puts the quote number at the top of the invoice, so it's right there front and center. In addition, when you recall the, the stored quote, it's going to show it and put it right at the beginning of the memo. It'll say, in this case, quote number one. Moving on to disabling the second receipt when the signature skips. So if you skip a signature in Paladin, it automatically produces two receipts. One, presumably so the customer can sign it and give it to you, and the other one so they can have and take with them. But that's the only logical way to do this if they're not either one signing electronically or um, signing at all. So if you select this option, it'll only print one receipt. When the, skip, when the signature is skipped at checkout. Next one, enable tax holiday. So if you notice uh, on your right click, this display box you see in the center here is a right click of the invoice on a particular uh, invoice, on any invoice, there's an option to add a tax holiday. So tax holiday is, is a program that somebody came up with, some creative uh, local government came up with to say, hey, you know, if they buy a $400 bicycle, we'll give them $200 off uh, for taxes. I mean, we'll take take taxes off for the first $200. Kind of odd, it's kind of weird, but we have a solution for it. It's really easy. Just right click on the item you're on, select tax holiday, or hold down control and press the letter T. When you do, it'll pop up and say, enter the amount of this line that will be sold without sales tax. So if this is, uh, you know, uh, a tire or something that you're buying and it says it's $200, but you get $50 of it is without sales tax, you just put it in here and we do the rest. All right, next, uh, second to last here, we have enable oversold warning. So this is probably new to a lot of you. This is a newer feature. It's been in the system for, I don't know, a few months now, six or plus, but we've uh, enhanced it slightly. So if you wanted to be interrupted at checkout and get a nice little pop-up box, if you're selling items for uh, that have less in stock than the quantity that you're selling, it's gonna come up and say, hey, attention, you know, uh, this, uh, this is, you have in, insufficient stock on hand, you know, for this particular part number. Do you wanna update the current quantity to what you have on hand? And you can say, okay, or just cancel. Uh, this is kind of, I believe, unnecessary for in-store products because the assumption is they're bringing it up, put it on your counter. They're gonna, you're going to scan it. It's right there. Why be notified that it's, it's not there when it is? But we added this feature where it enables you to use the same yard order inventory locations that you use for determining what get, when the yard order gets printed. We now have the ability to filter the oversold warning also by yard order inventory location. So meaning if it's out in the yard, I want to know if, it's, if I have insufficient stock, but if it's in store, I don't. And that's how this works. And then lastly, before we uh, conclude today's webinar, we've got the deleted stored quotes after so many days or set it to zero for never delete. So it defaults to zero. We assume that you want to keep these forever, but if you don't and you're okay with permanently deleting this, uh, these quotes, you can set a number of days. Say, hey, if they're more than 60 days or 90 days old, you know what? We don't need them anymore. They're so outdated. Just get rid of them. So if you have, if you've had the system for many, many years and you've just got gobs and gobs of quotes, go ahead and set this to however many days you want. 
And when it does a weekly data validation, which may not be the same day that you set it, it will go ahead and remove these. So just be aware that, again, if you set it to 60 days and you've got all kinds of uh, them in there that are greater than 60 days, wait a week before you check it again, just to make sure because, uh, you know, we will do it upon a weekly, a weekly data validation. All right, folks. Well, that concludes the webinar for today. It went a little long, did about 40 minutes here, so apologize for that, but, but your attention is welcome and appreciated. And the fact that you're here tells me that you want to learn, you're eager to learn more about Paladin in, in, uh, and making a difference in your store and growing your store. So we appreciate that. Don't stop learning ever. Uh, the next learning event and opportunity is on April 5th at 9 a.m. Pacific time, and that is where we talk about Paladin is making e-commerce easy. So we have a number of e-commerce integrations that we have out there today. We also have, if you haven't heard, an e-commerce API or application programming interface. So really any e-commerce platform that you choose, as long as you have a competent web programmer, they can hook into Paladin. So that's really cool as well. As always, uh, we really appreciate you coming today. I'm going to end with this slide, which just shows you that you can go to portable.palanpos.com slash webinars to see this webinar, which will be posted probably by the end of today, I would imagine. They're getting pretty quick at it. Uh, we also have the retail science site to learn more about uh, the retail and how, to, uh, how you can really help your store grow. And then our portal is our self-help tools or at portal.palanpos.com. So again, I do see a question here. Deleted stored quotes, can that be identified by department or class? No, not at this time. It's all quotes will be deleted regardless. So if you have something that you really need to stay in the system longer, I suppose you can go and recall that and resave it. And that should change that date. So it will stay in the system a little bit longer. But that's a great question. I appreciate it. I don't see any other questions in here. So uh, again, again, I do appreciate your time. Thanks for tuning in. Hope to see you again next time. God bless. Catch you later.